Good afternoon and welcome to The Angry Astronaut. Now, before people start accusing me of clickbaiting once again, I'm going to share with you a story that I saw on Carl Sagan's Cosmos when I was a little kid. Um, about 11 or so. The story of Paolo and Vincenzo. Paolo one day decides to take off on a new scooter that he's just picked up. What he doesn't realize is this is a relativistic scooter, a scooter that's capable of traveling very, very close to the speed of light. Paolo's a speed demon. He's really excited about all of this. He leaves his brother Vincenzo, his younger brother, on a park bench and tells him him to wait. Paolo then takes off on his relativistic scooter. It travels almost instantly up to a very high percentage of the speed of light, let's say 99.9999% of the speed of light. Uh, of course, the g-forces are tremendous, but Paolo's a tough kid, so he's able to deal with all of this, and he goes roaring around the cosmos for what seems from his perspective to be only a few minutes. However, when he slows down and returns home, he discovers that he has traveled about 70 light years. And even though less than half an hour has passed from his perspective, over 70 years have passed for everybody he ever knew. His parents, his friends, everybody is dead. And there, waiting for him, a 78-year-old man, Vincenzo, patiently waiting for his brother on that same park bench. Now, none of this is actually science fiction. This could actually happen. If we had a relativistic scooter capable of traveling this fast, you could travel this far into the future from, at least from your perspective, in a very short amount of time. Therefore, what I am saying in my, in the thumbnail that you've looked at in the title of this video is very accurate. If we can build a ship capable of traveling this fast, we will have not only the ability to travel between galaxies, but at least for all practical purposes, the ability to live forever, at least live for millions of years and compared to the short, brief lifespans that us humans experience now, that's as close to forever as we're ever going to get. But how is this possible? How could this be accomplished? Is this not just some work of some deranged mind and there's no way we could possibly achieve these sorts of speeds? Well, here's the reality. There's nothing in the laws of physics saying that we can't do this. It's just a matter of engineering. And there is one particular physicist who came up with a very innovative idea, one that I covered in a previous video called the Echo Lance Starship. I'm going to cover this in a lot more detail in just a moment. Now, during the course of this video, I'm going to be quoting extensively from a book called Ensman Echo Lance, written by the late Robert Duncan Ensman. And this is a ship that's designed to travel very close to the speed of light, utilizing principles that we understand very well today, and technology as well. The whole trick to getting to this kind of velocity is the efficient use of momentum, that is to say, converting energy into momentum directly, which is a very, very difficult thing to do. Chemical rockets don't even come close to doing this. You would require millions and millions of tons of propellant and oxidizer just to get a chemical rocket up to maybe 1% of the speed of light. There is no way with our current use of rockets that we can possibly begin to approach these kinds of velocities. Nuclear power even, fuel 
fusion power, that sort of thing, all of them experience the same problems. Yes, they can produce a tremendous amount of energy, but how do you convert that energy into direct momentum? One fairly efficient method of getting a starship up to a percentage of the speed of light is the method you're looking at right now called Project Orion, also known as a nuclear pulse starship. What this does is it detonates small nuclear weapons behind a large metal plate or a plate made of some other resilient material and that momentum or that explosive force produces a tremendous amount of thrust and could get a sizable ship up to about 10% of the speed of light. Not nearly fast enough for our purposes, but a project that we understood and had actually designed back in the 1950s and 60s. And by the way, this is something that Dr. Ensman talks about extensively. Most of the principles and most of the Starship designs that I'm going to be talking about were conceived 40 or 50 years ago or sometimes even further back than that. And if we had put enough effort behind the project, we could have been traveling between the stars now, or so Dr. Ensman claimed. And by the way, it's something that appears to have made him very, very angry, which is something that I can definitely relate to. But the elegant and simple solution delivered by the Echo Lance takes things to the next level. The whole idea is to transition energy into momentum directly and efficiently. And the best way to do this is to use gigantic particle accelerators. Now, this is the sort of thing that we often associate with experiments in physics or perhaps with weapons. And yes, particle accelerators can make for very devastating weapons but they can also make for ridiculously powerful engines. For example, if you wanted to generate 100,000 tons worth of thrust for Starflight, or the equivalent of 400 Raptor 2 engines, a particle accelerator engine could generate this much thrust using only one one-hundredth of a gram or less per second. Now, as impossible as that might sound, the reason for this is a particle accelerator is is accelerating the reaction mass to a very, very high percentage of the speed of light. The closer the reaction mass gets to the speed of light, the heavier the reaction mass becomes, and the more reaction mass you are actually producing with a particle accelerator. Now, of course, it takes more energy to accelerate this reaction mass up to that kind of speed, but this is how you get that much thrust out of such a small amount of fuel. It's also what makes particle accelerators such devastating weapons. A few thousandths of a gram of particles accelerated to this kind of speed would deliver the same explosive force as a 100-pound artillery shell moving from 3 to 20 miles per second. So particle beams can be extremely devastating weapons, and it was one of the reasons why this type of technology was being explored for SDI during the time of Ronald Reagan. Star Wars program. It's unfortunate that that got canceled, not because I believe that this would provide a completely efficient defense against nuclear missiles. You might be able to swamp something like that with more missiles, but because one of the technological spin-offs of this type of weapon could have been an engine that would have flung ships between the stars at a very high percentage of the speed of light, and the time dilation benefits would have allowed crew members on board to age very, very slowly, giving them the capability to travel hundreds, thousands, or even millions of light years in a single human lifetime. So how is all of this accomplished aside from just using particle accelerators? Well, for one thing, your ship does have to be pretty big, at least half to a full kilometer in length as shown here. Why is that the case? Well, it's because your particles need to be sped up in stages. Each time you speed up a particle to a percentage of the speed of light, that particle gets heavier. The closer you get to the speed of light, the more mass you accumulate. This is a very strange phenomenon, one that was predicted by Albert Einstein in his theory of relativity and confirmed through numerous laboratory experiments. The closer you get to the speed of light, the heavier you get. So the only way to efficiently accelerate 
accelerate a particle to a substantial percentage of the speed of light, or 99.999%, let's say, is to have it sped up in stages by multiple nuclear reactors. So the Echo Lance has a series of reactors. They could be fusion, fission, antimatter, whatever you want, it doesn't matter. Ionizing your reaction mass and progressively driving it faster and faster until it's traveling at nearly the speed of light by the time it leaves the ship. And by the way, since all of the energy is being converted into momentum, visually what this would create is a motionless gas behind the ship because all of the momentum would be transferred to the ship itself. Very strange things indeed involved with this technology. And as you can see, there's lots of other stuff included in this design, including nuclear-powered hypersonic spacecraft that would allow the Echo Lance to explore other planetary systems. But what else is involved in the design? Well, first of all, as the ship is traveling, the reaction mass becomes very, very hot. As you ionize it and accelerate it, it turns into a high-energy plasma, radiating heat of thousands and thousands of degrees that would melt just about any type of containment vessel. But keep in mind, the reaction mass is ionized, and if it's ionized, you can contain it using electromagnetic fields. So you would need that built into your particle accelerators, along with with a shield in front as well. Any particles heading towards your ship at a substantial percentage of the speed of light could do tremendous damage not only to the ship, but also to the occupants, being the equivalent of high-energy cosmic rays that would cause the crew to die of radiation sickness in a very short amount of time. But you can use what's called a combination of a Fresnel deflector and a photon scoop to deal with this problem. Now, what the hell does that mean? Well, what you're using is high-energy lasers to ionize all of the particles ahead of your ship. You then use an electromagnetic scoop to draw in all of those ions, therefore keeping them from hitting your ship, and instead use them as new reaction mass. Keep in mind they're already ionized and ready to be accelerated by the time they enter into the scoop. Therefore, you can use this as brand new fuel without having to carry it on board. This is a principle, by the way, that was first proposed by Dr. Robert Boussard in 1960 for a ship called the Boussard Ramjet, a ship designed to utilize the matter in interstellar space as fuel to push a ship to a substantial percentage of the speed of light. The Echo Lance does much the same thing, except using particle accelerators instead of fusion power. And once again, the faster the particles are traveling, the heavier they're going to be and therefore the more reaction mass they can generate. So the same thing that makes it very difficult to travel close to the speed of light, that is to say the increased mass, is also something that helps you with a particle accelerator drive which allows the Echo Lance to propel large amounts of mass to extremely high speeds. Let's go ahead and get Dr. Ensman's description of the ship directly out of the book. Quote, the Echo Lance's ship's mass will be between 20,000 tons and 50,000 tons. It will carry 10 nuclear reactors, each generating 1,000 megawatts. Echo Lance hulls will be 27 layers between passengers and space. The ship will have five spherical sections, three major spheres on an Echo Lance and between each, a deck for nuclear propulsion aircraft with three to five on each deck, nine to 15 total. The Echo Lance's modular spheres are 300 feet wide. There will be housing, apartments, machine shops, shipboard farming, glove docks, and different types of landing craft. A lance can carry up to 8,000 people. Lance ships travel in convoy and are capable of docking, repairing, and aiding each other or even in creating a new ship. They are equipped with triple redundancy, the ability to reproduce themselves three times. A ring of quarters in the sphere
spheres will rotate and counter-rotate to generate artificial gravity. There are family-sized quarters. One of the six sections houses all aboard. There are 32 housing sections per floor. Each house has a sort of yard around it where things can be raised, such as crops. There will be eight stories in 100-foot spheres. Each two-story housing unit will be round and soundproof. Each has a locker with a spacesuit and television is airtight and can open to other sleeping quarters. Each Echo Lance is equipped with laundries, farms, mini livestock, mini factories, and markets. Section doors are air and watertight, closed and bolted down at all times. Passengers must pass through a series of three or four doors to go from one section to another to standardize the pressure of air and water. Most precious is air. If it is lost, it can't be replaced. So a very large ship capable of housing thousands of travelers and or colonists traveling the enormous distances between the stars and barely aging while doing so. But what would be the process of getting to this kind of speed besides just using the particle accelerators? Well, another method would be to use the sun to get up to a substantial acceleration to begin with, utilizing some sort of nuclear tugs to push your ship towards the sun and once you were inside the orbit of Mercury to begin to accelerate towards the sun using its tremendous gravitational influence to accelerate to a percentage of the speed of light, probably only about 5% or so, but you could do that without using any fuel. And once you get up to that kind of speed, that's when you can kick in your bussard ramjet, your photon scoop that is, and begin gathering more reaction mass to add to the fuel that you already have on board. It would take approximately six months to a year to accelerate to 99.99% of the speed of light, depending on the g-forces involved. If you accelerated at perhaps 1.5 or 1.6 g's, well, you could cover some incredible distances in a reasonable amount of time. So what would it be like? Well, first of all, from your perspective, the entire universe would be compressed into a single halo or view screen, whatever you want to call it, in front of the ship. All the stars and galaxies in the universe would be compressed into this single multicolored halo with streaks sometimes from the ionized hydrogen being pulled into the photon scoop. It would be a strange experience indeed. And let's say you wanted to cover a huge amount of distance. Let's say you wanted to travel to the Andromeda Galaxy, over two and a half million light years away. If you maintained a constant acceleration of 1.5 g's all the way, you would arrive in just over 19.6 years. And by the way, that includes deceleration time. And how do you decelerate? Well, simply by reversing the process of the Bussard Ram Scoop. Instead of drawing the particles into your scoop, you instead ionize them and use them to repel, change the polarity of your magnetic field, and use the particles between stars or between galaxies, and by the way, matter is much less common between galaxies than it is between stars, but ultimately it would decelerate you, and you could also use your particle accelerators to decelerate the ship as well, simply turning the ship around and applying the thrust of the particle accelerators in the opposite direction. And by the way, let's say you didn't want to stop. Let's say you wanted to sail straight through the Andromeda galaxy to a different destination, then only 10 years and 3 months would pass, whereas 2.5 million years would have passed for people you left behind. This is as close to living forever as I can imagine. But what kind of people would make such a journey? And what kind of society would this create? Well, we're going to explore all of that in our next episode as I continue to cover the Ensman Echo Lance. By the way, I have barely scratched the surface on this amazing book. I have it linked in the description if you want to buy it. I encourage all of you to do so. Also, please smash that like, hit that subscribe, hit those notification bell buttons, and also check the description for various ways to keep supporting my content so I can keep bringing it to you. And as always, stay angry about space.